Hi, uh, my name is uh, Fernando uh, J. Martinez. I'm the chief of the division of pulmonary and critical care medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. Uh, welcome to our program. Uh, we uh, will discuss strategies to reduce morbidity and mortality in COPD. And we're gonna try to take a patient-centered approach for integrating combination and triple therapy. Uh, it, you're fortunate to have two uh, colleagues of mine who are accomplished uh, clinicians and investigators in this arena. Uh, Nick Canania is an associate professor of pulmonary and critical care medicine at Baylor, uh, and uh, worked with him for many years. Nick, since you were a baby. Uh, and then Ramon Reyes, who is an accomplished uh, primary care clinician, who's also the medical director of the Bandera Family Health uh, Care located in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, welcome to both of you. Uh, you can see on the screen that we have our credentials uh, and relevant uh, disclosures. Uh, the, the program for tonight is going to try to provide uh, you with some of the more recent information regarding some of these issues of combination therapy. Uh, and just remember during the, the program, uh, be sure to provide some comments uh, and, and let us know where you're watching from. And if you haven't done it yet, there was a little thing when you guys were first starting on that, that provided you a link to the pretest. Uh, which is the, it's a, I'll just read it for you so you can uh, do this at any time. Not that you want to, don't want to pay attention to Ramon and Nick, but if you have an opportunity there, take a little pretest because you'll need it for CME. Uh, it's www.integrityce.com backslash COPD pretest2. So that'll be an important uh, component. Nick, you are the controller of slides. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, there are going to be three major uh, learning objectives that we would like to cover during the course of this uh, program. Uh, 45 minutes or so. We're going to describe criteria for COPD diagnosis uh, and within the context of early uh, disease identification and stratification, we're going to provide you some of the updates uh, with regards to combination therapy. We'll sort of focus in part on bronchodilator therapy. Uh, we'll talk about triple therapy uh, and we'll integrate some of the other non-pharmacotherapeutic components, pulmonary rehab, oxygen therapy, to try to be as comprehensive as we can be over the course of 45 minutes. Uh, and, and so that just so you have that goal. Nick, I think you're going to lead off with sort of a discussion regarding burden and some of the important components. Yeah, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Fernando, thank you for having me and thank you for Integrity CME. And Ramon, it's a pleasure to share the screen with you here tonight. And uh, uh, and I'm, I'm glad the COPD Foundation is uh, supporting this program and we thank them as well. It's a great organization and, and we certainly uh, favor our collaboration with them. So yeah, my task to start with, Fernando, is to give the audience uh, a glimpse of what but we know about COPD regarding the burden and unmet need. Yes, it's 2021 and COPD continues to haunt us, both as clinicians, as patients, and as in the healthcare system. Uh, obviously, the prevalence in, uh, of COPD has been looked at different uh, statistics and these data on the slide, you see the different states where you are, and you can see the prevalence of COPD. And this is based on a, a rough questionnaire. Um, uh, the BRFSSS, uh, as we know, COPD patients usually are 40 years of age and older. Uh, this questionnaire was uh, given to any person above 18, but you can get a rough estimate of the prevalence ranging from 3.5% to up to 12.3% in some states. In general, we believe about 25 million Americans have this disease. But as you'll see in a minute, many of these patients don't have the diagnosis. It's a major disease. It's very prevalent, uh, depending on the state where you are, uh, as you see on the slide. But what's important is obviously the human cost is more important to us than dollars and cents. But it is important to look at the cost of the disease. The cost of the disease from the uh, cost perspective uh, has increased. As you see on this slide, it's an estimated uh, $49 billion are spent on COPD. And that includes both government funds, Medicare, Medicaid, but also private insurance. Uh, and it's been going up. And the majority of costs from COPD come from direct costs. That's hospital admission, emergency room visits. Uh, these are very important and that usually are inflicted by only about 10 to 20% of the population. So this thing has to be kept in mind that majority of COPD patients are actually seen in our by our family practice primary care docs that Dr. Ramon Reyes here uh, 
only the very sick ones that we see in the hospital, and those are the ones that afflict the system with quite a bit of costs. However, indirect costs are very important. As you see on the bottom of the slides, indirect costs come from absenteeism of work. It's well known that patients with COPD tend to leave work early and retire early because of disability. There are also uh, days of work lost. And last but not the least, COPD is now the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. The almost uh, certainly it will be the third leading cause of death in the world. Uh, obviously, with COVID now, COVID pushed it down one, one, uh, one step down. But it is a major public health problem and continues to affect the patients and the healthcare system and, of course, affect us as clinicians. Well, you know, there's been several papers recently published on COPD and the diagnosis of COPD. We're going to spend lots of time tonight or this evening discussing the, the need for early diagnosis of COPD. And in, in a study uh, looking at 200 and 2010, uh, 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 the year of 2010, they found that there is a high prevalence of, uh, of undiagnosed COPD patients presenting to the hospital for the first time with an acute exacerbation. You know, Fernando and, and Ramon, you know, our cardiology colleagues call patients who are admitted with myocardial infarction a heart attack. I call COPD exacerbation needing hospital admission is a, a lung attack. And indeed, we know that these patients are at high risk of another admission and even of mortality. But imagine a large number of these patients have never had the diagnosis before they get admitted with an exacerbation. In my mind, this is a a true crime in a country where we boast about our healthcare system. We have one of the, the best healthcare system in the world. So we can always blame the patient for this, obviously, but that's not the case. Uh, patients do get come to us late in life, uh, and later on in the disease when they're very, very symptomatic. But it, we know that from many studies, and not only this one that I'm showing you, that we also as clinicians don't take a proactive role about COPD. We don't think about it when a smokers come in the office to ask the proper question, do the right thing, such as spirometry, which we will talk about in a few minutes. Well, when we look at spirometry, spirometry has been utilized more and more, so that's a good news. The bad news is that about 40% of patients don't have spirometry early on in the disease, and we know the diagnosis of COPD, at least based on the gold and other guidelines, it rests on pro proving that there is an obstructive pattern on spirometry. So a physiologic measurement is important to diagnose COPD. If we don't do it, we can miss the diagnosis. And obviously, if we miss the diagnosis, we can miss early management or treatment. In this particular study that you're seeing on the slide, they tried to identify what are factors that were associated with increased likelihood of, of having had a spirometry. And for some reason, the younger the age, uh, the patients who were male, men, white race, higher socioeconomic class, and those, what's interesting, those with higher number of comorbidities tend to have a, a, a better chance that they have had uh, spirometry. Uh, I, I, we can talk about this in, uh, in our discussion, not sure how to explain the, the younger age, uh, but uh, maybe because they, they, they push their doctors to, to know their numbers, they want to know what they are. Not sure about the men, obviously men uh, continue to be uh, affected by COPD, but let's not forget the prevalence of COPD in women now in the United States has exceeded the prevalence in men, which is uh, again a big turnaround from what we know. I found this paper, and Fernando, congratulations for this paper published this year. Um, you know a lot about it, but what I thought was interesting here, this was a survey, so you always have to be cautious about interpreting surveys, but the nice thing about this is that this is a, a, a survey that was done on clinicians like us, but uh, providers for COPD patients who identified patients with COPD. So there were two sides of the survey. And the take home message I want to show you, I point out a few things. One is uh, the question about using a questionnaire for assessing symptoms when it comes to a provider. Um, you can see that 80% of our primary care colleagues don't use any assessment tool to assess symptoms, like a MRC Disney scale or a CAT score, which we know are available and they're free to use. Um, 
and I mean, actually, when you look at, uh, you, you know, the, the diagnosis when, when about using spirometry, you can see, again, the discrepancy between what the patients responded and what the provided responded. More important, when you look at why is it that patients are not compliant with their medication, you can see the majority of physicians said it's cost and lack of efficacy or side effects. On the other hand, when you ask the patient, it's more forgetfulness. But this is, uh, you know, this is two things that I would like to point out from this survey. One is that the way the patients perceive their disease is quite different than where we as clinicians and providers do. And that really pushes us to a point that communication between us and the patients are very, very important to clear up the point right from the very first visit. Uh, second is obviously there are lots of perceptions from the patients that are different regarding medications. Uh, they claim that the reason they're not taking their inhalers is forgetfulness, which may be true because many of them have multiple medications they have to deal with. But again, it, it really uh, pushes us uh, to the fact to remember that patient education is very important. And what we perceive is quite different than what our patients do. So that really uh, uh, is a summary of where we are in 2021 with COPD in the United States. Obviously, it's not a, a disease unique to the U.S. Yeah. But I want to turn it back to you, Fernando, yeah. to see if you have any points or so, Ramon, as well. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions for you guys. The first is that, that last paper for me, Nick, was instructive because, Ramon, those were primary care and pulmonary clinicians and their patients. We asked them to identify their own patients. And so there was just a huge discrepancy in some of the of the components of what a patient thought and what we thought as clinicians. But Ramon, since you are a primary care clinician, we, we count you as, a, as an honorary respirologist because you do so much work uh, in the respiratory arena. Uh, but you do have the, the key uh, ability to, to give us some insights regarding how a primary care clinician sees burden within the whole context of chronic disorders that you have to deal with. What do you think your primary care colleagues think of COPD versus hypertension, diabetes, a lot of the other things that you have to manage every day? No, thank you, Fernando and Nick, for letting me be part of this presentation today. And, and it's an important because now I'm giving the voice of the primary care physicians. And as you said, Nick, 50% of these patients are seen by us in our primary care offices and our urgent cares. And unfortunately, uh, COPD gets diluted into all the chronic diseases that we have in primary care. So it's a very important issue for us to realize uh, that the COPDs are in our practices. And, and, and they represent, as you said, Nick, a big burden on the cost of healthcare. You know, I do a lot of value-based medicine. And in the older population, almost 50% of the ER visits and the hospital utilization of that, those patients in those panels, when they get admitted to the hospital, are based on respiratory diagnosis. Wow. And recently, uh, Fernando, I saw the data two days ago on an HMO for younger people, they were showing us the utilization in the emergency room. 40% of wow. all the ER visits Wow. We're related to respiratory diagnosis on non-Medicare patients. These are people that are younger population. Wow. So the patients are there, you know, in our primary care office, and we need to do a better job trying to identify them and then diagnosing them as we're going to talk later so that we can treat them appropriately. Wow, 40 to 50%, Nick. Uh, and one of the things you said that's really interesting there, Ramon, is uh, Nick and I are involved in a series of studies that are trying to, to move the needle back in COPD from older to younger. And I think that that data that you describe is really very, uh, very instrumental in that respect. One, one other quick question before we move to the next section, which is how, how do both of you view the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, on COPD diagnosis, management, how primary care clinicians have viewed COPD within that context. Uh, Nick, you first. Yeah, well, there are good news and bad news here. So one of the good news that emerged from U.S. but other countries is that we've seen a decline in hospital admissions for COPD exacerbation. 
and that may partly be explained because patients are sitting at home, not, not exposed to other triggers. Maybe they become more compliant with their maintenance medication because they don't, really don't want to get sick or more than one reason. But that's the good news. The bad news is these patients, if they get COVID-19, they are at high risk of uh, complications. This has been shown, maybe related to the smoking and the ACE2, re ACE2 receptor, which is a very important receptor for the virus. We don't know, but in fact is they are considered high risk. One of the ways it changed our practice too is the ability to see the patient face to face. Now, obviously things are opening up. We are seeing them, but we really miss the personal touch with seeing the patient, listening to the lungs, doing lung function. At one time, our lung function lab was closed. They wouldn't do it unless we test the patient for COVID. Now it's opening up if they're vaccinated. So I missed that part. And I think I missed the part of being able to talk to the patient, educate them, showing them how to use inhaler. We used video. Mm -hmm. It was okay, but it was a compromise. And I'm glad things are opening up that we can see them again face to face. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Ramon, what do you think from the primary care? You know, you know, like you said, Nick, you know, good news and bad news. You know, for a little while, the, the patients were not coming. But those that were coming with COPD, the sad part is that they were at higher risk for complications and worse outcomes when they got covered. What we did in our clinic, uh, we decided that all the patients that were coughing, we assumed that they had COVID. So everybody that came to the clinic with a cough, they were treated as a COVID patient. Yep. So we did all the workup to make sure that they were not having COVID or flu. And, and, you know, and in a good sense, you know, we also had a cough questionnaire that if the COVID was negative and the flu was negative, it were triggered to us uh, when we were doing the vital signs and assessing these patients. If they were smokers with cough, it would trigger that they would probably had COPD. And then we were, when we started to do PFTs again, then we were very aggressive with trying to diagnose these people with COPD if they mm -hmm. have COPD by doing a spirometry yeah. on these patients. Yeah, well, so that's really, uh, it leads perfectly into the next series of discussions, Ramon Briggers. We're going to talk about COPD diagnosis. Uh, and so the, the first thing to understand is that the respiratory societies and the multi-specialty groups, this happens to be from the, the Gold the Science Committee, uh, have made you know, relatively simple recommendations on when to consider a COPD diagnosis. This is relatively straightforward for most of our clinicians that are listening or participating. But just to remind you, uh, breathlessness, particularly one that's sort of progressive over time, uh, a cough that may be intermittent, uh, with maybe maybe associated with recurrent wheeze. Uh, risk factors are particularly important, as Ramon had mentioned, and so smoking for sure is one that in your practice has generated that automatic trigger, which I love. Uh, and then there's a lot of interest right now in the COPD world regarding the implications of earlier life events, prematurity, low birth weight. So, so that's now become part of my questions uh, to, to patients with potential COPD. So the idea being sort of keep these clinical features in mind. Uh, and in the next slide, Gold tries to give you a way of synthesizing this information, which is those symptoms that we described, the risk factors, either one or both of those sort of trigger as Ramon's trigger has been in his uh, center the thought of a diagnostic test for uh, COPD, which really is spirometry. That's why it's in the middle of this slide. It's such an important diagnostic uh, component. Uh, and Nick's already shown you that even in the most recent data, only half the patients are getting spirometry at any given time. The, the Gold Science Committee extended these information by saying, yep, we acknowledge it's important to know about symptoms and early life events and exposure to a potential, uh, you know, causes of COPD, uh, but you need to do spirometry for diagnosis, uh, not just for the staging of the patient, but for the diagnosis. So this particular slide demonstrates that the left-hand side shows you that COPD is diagnosed spirometry. So there's spirometrically confirmed COPD, uh, and, and the approach to making that diagnosis is really quite easy. Only two numbers that you have to look at in that whole readout. It's the FVC, the forced vital capacity, and the forced expired volume in the first second, FEV1. And if the ratio of those two is less than 0.7, obstruction. The severity of obstruction is the second column in that slide, which is based on the FEV1 uh, as predicted for that individual patient. 
And then the, the right-hand side, which we'll spend a little more time talking about, is a way of providing personalization of care for the patient, treating the two main factors that we can clearly influence favorably with our current therapies, and that is symptoms, that's the, the bottom uh, axis, x-axis, uh, and the y-axis is the history of exacerbations, which is the best predictor for an individual patient of their risk for a future exacerbation. So the idea was to characterize patients once you've made that diagnosis with spirometry into clinical groups that would guide your therapy. More symptoms are the B and D groups. Less symptoms are the CNA group. And Nick, that's where this questionnaire at the bottom, those MMRC and CAT are two questionnaires. And you've seen in that earlier study that we did that the use of those questionnaires is remarkably variable by both primary and pulmonary clinicians in the U.S. Uh, so, Ramon, one of the things I'm going to ask you what is what you've done in your practice to try to get some of those uh, objective measures of symptoms completed. And then the idea being that if you're in the C and D groups, in those higher groups, you're at higher risk for an exacerbation because you've had more frequent exacerbations in the past or you've been hospitalized. That's the high-risk population. And then the A and B, the lower group, are at lower risk. So the idea with this four quadrant was to characterize patients as higher symptoms, lower symptoms, higher risk of exacerbations, or lower risk of exacerbations. But, Ramon, as you look at this slide and the previous two slides, it's very clear the recommendation that the way you diagnose COPD is spirometrically. Mm -hmm. a, a cardiologist couldn't imagine making a heart failure diagnosis without an echo. And you guys uh, that deal with hypertension in your clinics and your practice every day know how to do a blood pressure measurement. And so you saw the data from Nick regarding underuse of spirometry, and you've seen these. So now the question to you is, what do you think is the, is the challenge that's present in implementing this spirometry? And what do you recommend or what have you successfully done to be able to achieve that? And no, no, no doubt, you know, that, you know as, as you have discussed, Fernando and Nick, spirometry is being underutilized. And, and if we can see the next slide is being underutilized on, on primary care. And, and part of the issue for some people is that they don't have access to lung function labs, and especially if they're in rural areas. And even physicians that are in cities, in primary care, a lot of the physicians don't have uh, spirometry machines in their offices. Then when they have the spirometry machines, they're not using them correctly. They're not training the people to use it correctly. So we're not diagnosing the patients with COPD with spirometry because spirometry is the gold standard. Yeah. You know, we can, you know, like you said, Nick, having a, an, an exacerbation of COPD is the equivalent of an attack. It's like, how can you treat a heart attack without an EKG? How can you treat a diabetic without a hemoglobin A1C, how can you treat a COPD exacerbation without a spirometry? But we're doing that in primary care. Yep. So in a 2018 study, it was reported that only 56% of patients that have a doctor diagnosis of COPD have ever had a spirometry. So we are diagnosing COPD, but 50% of the time, Spirometries are never done. And then when spirometries are done, what I have seen in my clinic is that some of the times they're not being done correctly or the findings of the spirometry are not concordant with the diagnosis that we have. Yeah. So we have a diagnosis of COPD, but the spirometry doesn't match COPD. We have a diagnosis with asthma, but it doesn't matter, match asthma. So definitely in primary care, spirometry is being underutilized. So we can see the other slide. If we're not using spirometry, then how are we gonna diagnose people? So can we do it with symptoms? You know, and obviously we could, we could do it with symptoms. You know, like you said, Fernando, smoking history, previous respiratory diseases, abnormal breath sounds, on the examination, prolonged expiratory phase may help in the diagnosis of COPD. And when we pull all, all those together, so all those symptoms together, we may have a good clinical impression that the patient has COPD. 
So it could be as, as sensitive as, as 83%, but still, you know, we're gonna, if we're only using symptoms, we're gonna miss a lot of patients that have COPD. And if we're missing those patients, diagnosis of patients with COPD, and we're not diagnosing them appropriately, those patients are progressing in their disease. Yep. And those are the patients for Nando and Nick that are going into the emergency rooms and they're going into the hospitals with long exacerbations that if we would have done the diagnosis in the offices, we could have instituted a treatment to reduce exacerbations and reduce admissions and reduce ER visits. Well, that's actually quite uh, a perfect segue because that leads us to the next topic of discussion, Abon, which is uh, why it's important to make this diagnosis and why there are therapeutic paradigms that actually work. So we're going to shift over now to some of the treatment components, uh, Nick and, uh, and Ramon. Uh, and the first slide is a relatively simple slide. It's, you know, we're going to talk about COP treatment, uh, and that includes trying to stop exposure, and smoking and you know, the vaping issue remains a controversy for us. Vaccinations, that includes now COVID-19. Remember that, we all adults vaccinated in the U.S. That's our mantra here. Uh, regular exercise, which hopefully will be a little easier now that some of the restrictions are easing. And then appropriate and early pharmacological treatment. That, that's one of the things we're going to focus on. Uh, in the next slide, it, it is important for all of us to realize that for all patients, no matter whether in the A, B, C, D, whatever quadrant they're in, there are a series of things that we recommend through GOLD for all of them. Stop smoking, pulmonary rehab for symptom improvement, maintain activity, try to be as active as you can, and then vaccination. And we actually have an entire section in the latest GOLD uh, strategy, which is on COVID and COVID vaccination. And so uh, I think that that becomes a crucial component of what we're doing. So never forget the non-pharmacological components that need to be used in all of our patients. But now the, the next slide is how we try to conceptualize for you, for all of us, more important for our patients, how we could use this idea of stratifying patients by more symptoms or less symptoms, higher risk of exacerbations or lower risk of exacerbations, as Ramon said, and to try to give you some guidance on how to personalize treatment for those individuals. So for the folks that have more symptoms, so that's the right-hand side of this slide, folks that have a higher breathlessness scale by MMRC or the CAT score or its equivalent, you can see that the, the agents that are being used, and Nick will give you some data on what each of these agents are a little bit later on, but everything with an L is a long-acting bronchodilator. A long-acting antimuscarinic is a LAMA. A long-acting bronchodilator, a beta agonist is a LABA. Combinations of those. So you see that for more symptoms, everything on that right-hand side is some, some long-acting bronchodilator. Because the idea being that long-acting bronchodilators are the best pharmacotherapy that we have to decrease breathlessness in our patients. And then when you look at the left-hand side and you look at people that are at higher risk of exacerbations, those groups C and D, you start having not only long-acting agents, but you start seeing inhaled steroids. So in contrast to asthma and COPD, inhaled steroids are principally being given for the high-risk exacerbation patients. And, and so that, that is the idea of personalization of therapy based on this goal strategy. This particular algorithm and the, the four-quadrant system was for initial. What Nick is now showing you is that in the most recent version of GOLD, we try to give you further guidance on how we longitudinally manage the patient, how we make changes over time. And again, focusing on the concept that the two key things that we know we can favorably affect in a COPD patient, improving dyspnea and decreasing exacerbations, are what we're now considering treatable traits, or traits that you can treat with current agents. And so we've sort of given you a sense of if you're dealing in the dyspneic component, if a patient has not had an exacerbation, but they're dyspneic, the idea is use long-acting bronchodilators, alone or in combination. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, consider whether the patient is using their inhaler correctly. Institute pulmonary rehab. So those are the things that are in this dyspnea trait component, whereas the exacerbation component is more consider when to use inhaled steroids in combination with a LABA. Also note that in contrast to asthma, we never use inhaled steroids alone in COPD. They're always in combination with a long-acting bronchodilator. Uh, and we'll talk about whether it's a LABA ICS, a dual regimen, or whether it's the triple, 
where you have all of the medications that are inhaled in one device. And you can see that we sort of give you a sense of how to escalate and how potentially to de-escalate. And one thing that's new in these algorithms are all those little asterisks. And those little asterisks reflect, reflect circulating eosinophils. It, it's now become very well accepted in the COPD field that higher levels of eosinophils, certainly higher than 300, but likely higher than 100, predict a patient who is more likely to experience an exacerbation reduction with uh, a, a steroid-based uh, therapy. So that's one of the comments that, Ramon, I'll come back to you to see how we can operationalize that for our, for our uh, primary care clinicians. And then lastly, Nick, the, the last slide that I'm going to present on this section is sort of a parallel group. I was part of this group as well that did a very rigorous evidence-based recommendation of how to uh, incorporate the available data and made a very strong recommendation, Nick, for dual bronchodilation. And so I'm going to, and I know you're going to turn to that in a second. Uh, and you're also going to talk about some of the steroid based recommendations. Mm -hmm. But part of what I want you to see is that the international uh, societies that are making recommendations for therapy, all of these include primary care clinicians, Ramon, uh, have really started to provide much more granular guidance on combinations of bronchodilators and combinations with an inhaled steroid. And so, it, it, Nick, what, I, what I'd like to do at this point, if possible, is to switch it back over to you because mm -hmm. you're going to provide a little more granularity about the dual bronchodilators and the combinations of steroids in your next few slides. And I, I, I'm going to come back, Ramon, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions regarding how you think we can best operationalize these recommendations for our primary care clinicians. Yeah, thanks, Fernando. I think... Uh you know, the ATS guidelines that you see on the slide, they they sort of uh, put its recommendation of using a dual bronchodilator in patients who have symptomatic COPD. We know we have been talking about symptoms and dyspnea, which is a very prevalent uh, problem in the patient's, uh, uh, you know, life, day-to-day -day activity, and exercise tolerance is a big problem. And so, uh, Historically, we used or usually used one long-acting bronchodilator, either a LABA or a LAMA. But one of the tasks of the ATS uh, guidelines was to actually answer the question, uh, in patients who continue to have symptoms, would a dual LABA-LAMA be uh, a LABA-LAMA combination be better than LABA alone or LAMA alone? And indeed, they found in a systematic analysis that it is. And this is based on multiple studies. This is one of them that you see here where well, actually they looked at, and there are multiple laba lamas out there. This is umeclidinium bilanterol versus salmirol or versus umeclidinium alone. So they compared the combination in patients with COPD on different outcomes. These are patient reported outcomes, breathlessness, symptom burden, rescue free days. And no matter what you look at, patients who received a dual bronchodilator, and now we have many of them, that come in one inhaler device, so we don't need to complicate the regimen and give them more than one inhaler, do better than patients with just a LABA alone or a LAMA alone. And these are in patients who did not need uh, inhaled corticosteroid, did not have history of exacerbation. Just to make sure that symptoms are very important in these COPD and optimizing symptoms early on is very, very important. And maybe in those patients who don't respond to the short-acting agents when needed. They need a long-acting agent. A dual uh, a bronchodilator combination may may be favorable, at least from uh, evidence, at least uh, literature. And and you know nowadays we have quite a bit of uh, lavas and lamas. I'm so happy that the armamentarium for therapy of COPD is growing. It it is good, but it's also bad in a way because it can sometimes confuse prescriber and patients. So I really want to pass a message here for device selection. It's very, very important. We talk about personalized medicine. And uh, Fernando, you mentioned the use of eosinophil to help us identify who may respond to steroid. That's one way of looking at personalized medicine or what we call precision medicine, if, it's, if, it, if, if I may use that term. But personalized medicine also rests on a very simple uh, question which device is best for that patient? Because we know about 60 to 70% of COPD patients don't know how to use the inhaler correctly. And so you have to really decide which device is best for the patient. As you see here, we have many LABAs, many LAMAs. They come in different delivery systems, nebulization, 
soft mist inhaler or re rescue mat, dry powder inhaler, uh, or a regular MDI, which is a, a, a buffer inhaler. So I think that these agents have very similar pharmacology, but the delivery systems are different. When it comes to Lava Lama, as you see here, we also have several out there, uh, with the MD MDI, the DPI, the soft mist inhaler. Obviously, there are some other complicating issues that may uh, affect your decision which one to prescribe, including cost and reimbursement. But also, don't forget that the patient's use of the device and ability to use the device, cognition is important, physical motor, uh, motor ability, um, is also very important. And then obviously other pharmacologic agents available and approved for COPD include those co that contain inhaled corticosteroids, the LABA ICS, which we have four, again, in different delivery systems, but we also have now two triple inhalers approved in the U.S. for patients with severe COPD, and these include the LABA, LAMA, and, and inhaled corticosteroid. Again, one is a dry powder inhaler, one is a meter dose inhaler. So the, the question is which, uh, which patient population would fit best for an inhaled corticosteroid? We talked about the LABA LAMA in those who are very symptomatic, who, who, who have symptoms despite being on a long acting bronchodilator. But when do we consider adding an inhaled corticosteroid? And it's based on evidence. Those patients with severe exacerbations um, who already are on a LABA LAMA continue to have exacerbations two or more a year, but definitely patients who have blood eosinophils more than 300 cells per cubic liter. Uh, so yes, we are now measuring CBC with differential in these patients. It can help us identify patients who may need inhaled corticosteroid studies have shown that those with low eosinophil at baseline uh, may actually not benefit uh, from inhaled corticosteroid. Yeah. And certainly some, some of these uh, uh, other age things that may um, uh, may not favor inhaled steroids is history of uh, repeated pneumonia and history of mycobacterial infections. Yeah. So there are some strategies that we have now adopted based on the uh, the recommendation from GOLD and the ATS guidelines that pharmacologically that help us identify who uh, who would qualify for one versus the other. And the more and more drugs we can we have in the in the U.S. now for COPD. The, the, the more options we have, but the better, hopefully, outcomes. So I'll turn it back to you, yeah. Fernando, since you had some questions. Yeah, so I'm, what I'm going to do is the following. Uh, Ramon, I want you to keep in mind a, a series of things that I'm going to ask you to comment on in a couple of minutes, and yes. that is the idea of escalating or starting with a, high, with a combination bronchodilators, when to use steroids, how frequently primary clinicians do uh, CBCs and how frequently that we think they should. So remember those three points because I'm going to come back to them again. But what I want to do first is to show you some of the most recent data regarding morbidity and mortality because you highlighted some of that, Ramon, in terms of preventing complications. So remember, non-pharmacological treatments do have a beneficial effect. And the next slide, if you actually go two slides, Nick, sure. uh, is a slide from Peter Lindenauer that, suggesting that uh, pulmonary rehab is actually associated with an improvement in overall survival. So don't forget the pulmonary rehab component. Ramon, that's point number four that I'm going to ask you. Combination bronchodilators, escalating, steroids, eosinophils, pulmonary rehab. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth thing, Ramon, so you can write there because you're younger than I am, so your memory is better than mm -hmm. mine, uh, that I will ask you is how the next series of data you think influence you or your primary care clinicians. So these are based on two large studies that Nick and I had the good fortune of participating in, which were in severe COPD. So these were people that had lots of exacerbations. They had severe COPD. This is a unique, much much more uh, advanced patient population. But the, the key component here was that in both of these studies, the ETHO study and the IMPACT study, there was a triple inhaled steroid, uh, that, that, a, a triple inhaled medication that is Lava, Lama, and ICS, as Nick just showed you, compared to the individual combination. And that was the case in both ethos and impact. So it was the same inhaler device, but different combinations of medications. You can see that these were generally older patients that had pretty significant COPD with lung function in the mid-40s. And the bottom shows the frequency of exacerbations. So these were people that had pretty advanced disease. 
the next slide is one of the components that you mentioned earlier, Ramon, and this goes to show that in both of these studies, independently, different devices, different drugs, same compound classes, when you combine three drugs in one device, you had a better effect on time to exacerbation or the rate of exacerbations. That was the primary endpoint. So you could, in fact, say that if you had three medications in one device in severe COPD, you could enhance exacerbation outcomes. So that was not surprising. I think we all expected and wanted to see that. The next slide is the slide that really, for us, was the shocking component. Not in a good way, not a bad way. And that was all-cause mortality. So in these severe COPD patients, both the ethos on the left and the impact on the right demonstrated the highest mortality in patients that were just on the bronchodilators, the combination of bronchodilators, Alaba and Alama, and steroids, particularly when it was the triple combination, clearly decreased the risk of mortality. So now when I come to the next slide, I come back to you, Ramon, and remember, I'm asking you now what you think the primary clinicians should keep in mind regarding dual bronchodilators, mm -hmm. when to use steroids, do they use eosinophils, when would they consider doing triple, and when should they con consider doing triple, uh, and then lastly, pulmonary rehab, and I'm going to give you a minute and a half to address that, Ramon, because Nick still has a couple of things that he needs to cover that I think are important components. So, Back to you. You know, you know that, that's a good inf information for us. I want to say that 10% of your patients spend 80% of your healthcare dollars. And of those 10% of your patients, when you look at admissions and ear visit, 40 to 50% of them have COPD or asthma, and some may have pneumonia and bronchitis. But 40 to 50% of all your morbidity, admissions to ER exacerbations, and the people that are dying are related to respiratory diagnosis, COPD and asthma. Yep. So we have to, we have to, in primary care, impact symptoms and impact exacerbations and admissions. And the only way we can do that, Fernando and Nick, is by using combination therapy from people that are very symptomatic. But if you have people that are getting admitted to the hospital and you have people that are going to the emergency room with exacerbations or coming to your clinic with frequent exacerbations, those are the people that have to be on triple therapy. Yep. Because triple therapy has shown that it reduces exacerbations, it reduces admissions, and it may reduce by reducing those two, remember, the more exacerbations you have, the more mortality you're going to have eventually. So you have to reduce exacerbation. I'm going to say this. We have to do eosinophils, CVC, and primary care. We have to. It's not, oh, we're going to do it if we can, because if the eosinophils are high, then that's telling you already in primary care that that patient probably is going to need triple therapy. It probably going to need inhaled corticosteroids because when you use, as, you, as Nick and Fernando, you know, when you use steroids, the eosinophils go down. When the eosinophils go down, exacerbations and admissions can go down and progression on the disease to mortality go down. So there's no doubt in this clinic, in our clinic, every primary care provider, we have eight of them, have to order eosinophils with CBC, not just CBC, it has to have eosinophils. And when the number is high, triple therapy has to be there. And then we also do pulmonary rehab, because as you know, if you do pulmonary rehab, you can impact the exacerbations, you can impact mortality. So we have created a relationship with the only place in town that does pulmonary rehab. We have their form. We have it, we, is, we just have to complete it and fill it and send it. So we don't only in primary care, we have to do spirometry more. We have to do eosinophils more. We need to do combination therapy more, triple therapy more, and be comfortable sending our patients to pulmonary rehab. Oh, we have to, 
because we're seeing 50% of the patients. So it's our responsibility to manage them in accordance to the guidelines. I love it. I, I know your pulmonary rehab program there in San Antonio. It's very good. Nick, why don't, why don't we switch over and you can give us a quick little update on oxygen therapy as we're tailing off here at the very end. Yeah, let's not forget that, you know, obviously the non-pharmacologic approaches you mentioned are very important, Fernando, but oxygen continues to be a very important avenue in hypoxemic patients. Uh, you know, criteria haven't changed so much. Patients have to document that they're stable, they're hypoxemic on room air, and they would qualify for oxygen. A large NIH study there, there did not show that patients with just exercise-induced hypoxemia that there was any uh, outcome uh, improvement. So that's why right now there is really no good rationale for prescribing oxygen for those patients who are not hypoxemic on room air who desaturate on exercise. But we know that adherence to oxygen has been a challenge for many reasons. One thing, patients don't want to carry their oxygen. They, want it, they don't want to be stuck with it. Education issues, reimbursement issues. So I think that's something that we as clinicians, both primary care and specialists, should be aware of. And actually, a very nice program now started by COPD Foundation, the Oxygen 360 program. And I have the website there. It actually is a new project that aims to modernize uh, every aspect of oxygen therapy, working not only with the patient, but with the DME provider and with, uh, with, the, with the clinician to improve uh, uh, the use of oxygen, the education about it, the equipment. And I think that's something that's great and we need uh, more of this type of programs in the future. So I think it's not just about drug. We talked about smoking cessation, exercise, pulmonary rehab, early diagnosis, of course, medications are very important. Personalizing the medication is so important. And of course, oxygen uh, is also important. Yeah, I love it. All right, so let, let me uh, summarize this uh, for all of you with just a, a few uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, as we've all heard, and I think Ramon, you presented it so uh, eloquently, uh, uh, Nick showed you that COPD prevalence in the US is bad. And uh, unfortunately, it, there's now a gender discrepancy. Uh, there are still a whole series of problems that we're all dealing with, with diagnosis uh, and the use of spirometry. Uh, I think that now that the pandemic is winding down a bit, knock on wood, uh, that we will be able to get to uh, recognizing spirometry is essential. Ramon clearly demonstrated that the clinical impression can be sensitive, but it's clearly not specific. Uh, and that, again, highlights the importance of spirometry. Uh, as we've all said, there are the recommendations currently for pharmacotherapy are pretty explicit. And I think Ramon uh, emphasized the key concepts in all of those that includes bronchodilators in combination for symptomatic patients. We should be doing CBC with differential. You should be using inhaled steroids, uh, particularly in those with high eosinophils and history of exacerbations. Nick has eloquently demonstrated that we have to consider always smoking cessation, activity, personalization to the patient, even with a device, but also the pulmonary rehab component and the important use uh, of oxygen in appropriate patients. Uh, and so with all of those concepts, I think that uh, I wanted to thank both of you for this wonderful discussion and really nice little elevator uh, pitches there and bullet points. Uh, to all of us in the audience, to all of you in the audience, thanks for joining us and sticking with us, even though we're a few minutes over. Uh, make sure that you claim your CME credits by competing the post-test uh, and evaluation form, which is at the website that, uh, Nick, I think, is there one more slide there? I'm not sure if we have, uh, oh yeah, there it is. It's, it's the claim credit component up there uh, at the uh, integrityce.com backslash COPD post-test two. Uh, and have a wonderful uh, rest of your week and get your patients and all of your friends and uh, and colleagues to get their vaccines. Thank you very much for having me, Fernando. Good evening, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Fernando, and thank you, Nick. Nice to talk to you all. Bye-bye.